Hello, my name is Richard Felix and over the past year and a half I've been travelling the country conducting the national ghost tour of Great Britain. We've been in some very very spooky places and had quite a few paranormal experiences while we've been doing it. Of course a lot of the places that we've visited have been graveyards. Now it's rather a strange thing about graveyards because there are certain people that say that the last place to be haunted is a graveyard because all that's left here of course is the shell. The spirit, the soul, the entity has gone elsewhere. They say that ghosts and spirits haunt either the place they died or the place or person that they loved. But then why are there so many ghost stories connected with graveyards and cemeteries? They also say that there is always at least one ghost in every cemetery and they say that it's the ghost of the very first person ever to be buried who for some strange reason are condemned, for want of a better word, to haunt that graveyard for all eternity as custodian of that graveyard. So, settle back, turn down those lights, give me your full attention and let me take you on a tour of some of the most haunted graves in Great Britain. This is Greyfriars Churchyard. This is one of the most incredible graveyards I've ever seen in my life. It was laid down in 1560 and so contains some of the most incredible gravestones. Certainly in Scotland, but I must be honest with you, I've never seen gravestone like this anywhere in this country. It's something very special. This has been a scene of body snatching, witches, burials, paganism and the church was actually built in 1620 and in 1638 the National Covenant was actually signed inside that church. It's always been a place of hauntings and of ghosts but in 1998 a very strange phenomenon started when people walking through the graveyard were attacked by unseen hands. People were pushed over, people were bruised, people were scratched and in fact 24 people in all were actually knocked unconscious in this graveyard. A lot of psychical research was done and the entity that was causing it was labelled the Mackenzie Poltergeist. The houses around the graveyard were also disturbed by this poltergeist. Stones and bricks were thrown at the walls and vast amounts of pottery, old-fashioned pottery, were also thrown at the houses. Two exorcisms were done here and the actual area where that poltergeist activity took place even now is actually chained off. Now I find it strange that there should be such poltergeist activity in a churchyard because although they appear to be spooky places and when you look at some of the emblems on the walls and on some of the grave stones you can understand why they are spooky. But to be honest with you, graveyards aren't usually the most haunted places. It's said that the first person to be buried in a graveyard comes back as a ghost to protect all the other souls and spirits in that graveyard. But again, it's not usually poltergeist activity because poltergeists are usually energy forces using the mind of a living person, the energy of a person, usually children, 
especially girls, reaching puberty. So why this graveyard should have been so haunted by the Mackenzie poltergeist, no one really knows. And this is the area where all the psychic energy, the poltergeist activity, tends to emanate from. This was the old Covenanters prison and was the area where they were imprisoned, actually here, in this churchyard. Up on the wall here, a coffin, and behind it, the tools of the sextant, the man that dug the graves. And inside here, you can actually see the walls of the houses, where the stones, the bricks, and the pottery was thrown against it. And it's actually got gravestones and monuments on it. It's locked, as you can see. I'm quite glad, really, because I don't really think I'd like to go in there. It's not so bad in the daytime. I certainly wouldn't like to do it at night. Just before we leave this place, there's an even more important story. The story of Greyfriars Bobby, a little shepherd dog. So, let's go and find his master's grave before we leave. And while we're in Greyfriars Churchyard, a very haunting story, the story of Greyfriars Bobby, a little sheepdog, belonged to John Gray. He was a shepherd and he died in 1858 and for 14 years that shepherd's little dog kept a vigil here by his gravestone until eventually in 1972 the broken-hearted little dog died and is buried, obviously not in the churchyard, but very close by. I'm in the old graveyard at Boughton in Northamptonshire, and I'm now entering the ruins of the old St John's Church. This goes back at least to 1201, but it's believed that it could have much earlier foundations, and it has a ghost. Or in fact, more than one. There's the ghost of a young girl that's seen here, with red hair and blue eyes. She's always wearing a high-waisted dress. And also seen here, is the ghost of a handsome young man. They arrange a meeting between a live member of the public, always on Christmas Eve. And whichever person meets the ghost in the churchyard, they have a smile and a kiss, and then the ghost just disappears. Over 200 years ago, a handsome young groom married his red-headed wife here at Boughton. Within days, he died and his sad bride committed suicide in the churchyard. And they say that it's these two ghosts that still haunt this place, even to this day. Anyone who keeps the appointment makes the tryst. Rumour says that they die within a month of the meeting. So beware if you're wandering around Old St John's Churchyard here at Boughton.
Probably the most outrageous thing I've done on this tour up to now. I'm looking for the Rodney Street Spectre. It's in this churchyard and it's completely boarded up and gated. And the only way was over this wall, so here we go. We may be able to film the police arresting me as well. I'm inside. I'm going to be very quick before the police come. This incredible tomb here. Never seen anything like it. It's one of the most haunted places in Liverpool. This is the tomb of William Alistair Mackenzie. He was a famous character in Liverpool. He was a railway promoter and he was a gambler. He died, as people do. And in his will he said that he wanted to be buried, dressed, sitting at a card table with his winning hand on the table. That's exactly what happened. And the sitting up body of Mr. Mackenzie is actually inside that tomb. There are many, many ghost stories to do with it. In fact, there are more people that haven't seen him that have seen him. He's seen wearing a top hat and a cloak. People liken him to a vampire. Policemen have seen him, milkmen have seen him. People going to and from their jobs along Rodney Street have seen him. He even propositioned a prostitute. He hadn't got his top hat on and he was talking to her, asking how much she would charge. He then wrapped his cloak around him, put his top hat on and she fled to the local police station, told them that she'd been propositioned by this vampire and the policeman said to her, it wasn't in Rodney Street, was it? And just now, as I was trying to break in over the wall, um, a hot dog seller around the other side said, excuse me, mate, can you leave that board where it is? I said, well, can I just borrow it to break into the churchyard? Oh, he said, if you see a man in a top hat and a cloak, remember me to him, because he says, I've seen him on frequent occasions. I'm not waiting to see him. It's daylight now, but I'm going to break out of this churchyard and go home. This is the very imposing and very unusual graveyard of Liverpool Cathedral. This was once a quarry and they tell me that the stone for the cathedral came from this quarry which of course left a very large hole. What better than to use it as a graveyard. After my trip to uh, BBC Radio Merseyside, they told me there were many, many ghosts here. So many that I could spend the afternoon here talking about it. There are grey ladies, white ladies and vampires. But the most important ghost here is the limping spectre of William Huskisson. This is his mausoleum or memorial. He was buried here in September 1830 and he has the distinction of being the very first person in the world to be run over by a train and it wasn't just any old train. He was run over by Stevenson's rocket and they say that to this day his limping spectre still wanders this graveyard at dead of night. I'm strolling through a graveyard in the middle of the town of Alton and I'm looking for Sweet F.A. And I don't mean that in the wrong way, I really am looking for Sweet Fanny Adams. I'm looking for the grave of a young girl called Fanny Adams who was brutally murdered here in a field at Alton in 1867. She was murdered by a solicitor's clerk 
called Frederick Baker. Her body was then dismembered and parts of her body, after they were later found, were taken to the Leather and Bottle Public House in Amory Street here at Alton. Frederick Baker was caught, tried and sentenced to be hanged and was one of the last people to be publicly executed in front of the County Hall in Winchester. Public executions were in fact abolished in 1868 and this murder of course took place in 1867. This here is the memorial stone dedicated to the memory of Fanny Adams, aged eight years and four months, who was cruelly murdered on Saturday, August the 24th, 1867. She, of course, disappeared after she was playing with two friends, and it was days later that her body was found. And it was at the same time that the British Navy had its hardtack taken away from it and the new bully beef, corned beef, which replaced it. They didn't want to lose their old hardtack. It had disappeared and the sailors soon latched on to the same saying, of course. It was missing. Just as sweet Fanny Adams was missing. And that is where the saying came from, Sweet Fanny Adams. And her ghost has been seen wandering around this graveyard and also in the field where the murder took place. And it's become so famous that they even do a Fanny Adams trail around the town of Alton, searching for the ghost. I'm in the little historic village of Up Holland, very, very close to Wigan. This place goes back to the time of the Romans. And across the road, there used to be a ghost house. To the right hand side of the White Lion pub was a three story house where, over many hundreds of years, there have been reported sightings of a ghost, sounds of a ghost. Villagers used to say that they used to hear screams coming from the house and inside the house glasses, cups and saucers would fly about. Tongs and pokers from the fire used to dance about in front of the fire. The house was demolished and is now part of the car park of the White Lion pub. There is the ghost story of a gentleman of the road, a highwayman called George Lyon. He lived somewhere in Up Holland. Whether that was his house, nobody seems to know. But there have been many reported sightings in and around the village. And strangely enough, he is buried only 80 feet from the pub. Somewhere here in the churchyard of St Thomas the Martyr. So I think it would be probably a good idea to go inside the pub, see what we can find. And we're now inside the, the White Lion at Up Holland and, and with me, Jimmy, you're the, you're the landlord. Yes, I am. Yes. Um, I mean, have you seen anything inside the pub? I've never seen anything. We've only heard one voice and the, the voice said hello. <laughs> and there were three of us in that night, and there was nobody in the pub at all. We looked in every room, and, and that was it, just hello. Really? I mean, <laughs> did it come from behind the bar? Or, no, or? it definitely came from inside. Right. But nobody. nobody else in the, in the pub. Good grief. And all three of us heard it. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't the spirits behind the bar talking? No, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. Um, and what about, there was a previous landlord, he, he yeah. actually had an experience in the yeah, inside? or Mick, Mick had actually had two experiences. One was his cleaner. His cleaner actually saw saw a figure doing doing in that room there. Right. 
and then about three months later, Mick was actually cashing up down the bar, and he got a tap on his shoulder. And when he turned around, it was a nun in the Abbot and everything. Standing inside here? Just right behind him. And of course, the, the, this building is obviously stands on much earlier properties. Yeah, it, it's around about 1400s. Crikey. So it could, there could well be, have been something else, monastic house, yeah. nunnery, something around here that... Well, there is a nunnery across the road. Oh, say no more. And, and in, the, in the car park over there, you can actually see the archway, what led to it. But really? now there's only that much of the archway left because they built it up. Oh, I see. So she's obviously, for yeah. whatever reason, yeah. still haunting the area because of the nunnery across the road? Yeah, yeah. Hey, that's great. Well, we'll um, now the, the grave... He's not actually, you can't see his grave, can you, the, the highwayman's grave? Actually, you can. He's with his mother across the road. Really? Yeah. So they've actually buried him in his mum's grave? Yes. His mum's called Nanny Lion. Oh, my gosh. Oh, well, uh, that's just across the road there. I think I'll go and have a look. Jimmy, that's no great. Road. Thanks very much. Anytime. Cheers. Now, according to Jimmy, the grave is somewhere around here in the bushes. So, uh a quick search. He says it's a very plain looking grave. Some fantastic old graves here. This one going back to 1776. It's very close to the road. That's only something, it's not that one. Nanny Lion! This is it. Yeah, the grave of Nanny Lyon. Died April the 17th, I think, 1801. There it is, Lyon. And in here, underneath this gravestone, also the famous highwayman, George Lyon. He was actually the last highwayman to be hanged at Lancaster Prison. And I wonder, it's so close, look, the road is almost on top of the grave. It's not exactly disturbed it, but... Is that the reason that George Lyon still haunts this area? Who knows? I'm in the graveyard of St Giles Church, right in the centre of Oxford, on a beautiful sunny afternoon. Nothing seems more ghostly. But strangely enough, there is the ghost of a grey lady that wanders around this graveyard. She's been seen on many occasions by ordinary folks in the middle of Oxford, by revellers at night. Obviously, those revellers may be suffering from too many spirits behind the bar. But it's the ordinary folks that have seen her that make me believe that she is real, that she has been seen here. She's seen wandering and stopping and stooping and looking at the gravestones and shaking her head and then continuing and looking at other gravestones. They say that it's the ghost of a grey lady who died in the 18th century. She had left a considerable amount of money to local charities, but the money never got to them. It's believed that her family got hold of the money first and, of course, spent it. And I believe that is the reason that she still haunts. I don't know whether she's buried here or not, but certain people haunt places sometimes because they love the place, they love the house, and so they want to stay in it. They haunt people because they love the people. Some people even haunt cars because they love them so much and, if you like, don't want to give them up. But other people, and I think possibly in the case of this unfortunate girl here, haunts the place because she feels that she's been hard done to. She's restless because of the fact that the money that she left to go to charities never reached them. And so, until she can be released, her tormented soul will still wander around this beautiful little churchyard here in the centre of Oxford.
Scott Richard. This is Holy Trinity Church Goodrum Gate. A marvellous church. I would say if it weren't on the wrong side of the minster, it was within the shadows of it, but it is in fact just a stone's throw from York Minster. Yeah. It has 12th century origins, uh, 14th, 13th, 14th and 15th century construction, uh, 14th century painted glass, yeah. 16th century box pews. Aren't these wonderful? Incredible. Yeah. It also has a headless ghost. Oh. I'll tell you all about it. It's in the graveyard. Yes, please. The story starts not too long ago, yeah. when a young woman who works in one of the offices in York was having her lunch here in Holy Trinity Church. Now, during the summer months, this is a very popular churchyard, yeah. not only for visitors to the city, but the locals. Mm. And the locals like to come here to have their luncheon breaks. Well, on that occasion, she was very surprised when she arrived to find that the graveyard was empty. Yeah. Not a soul. Now this surprised her because there's usually a few people around, but on this occasion she had the place to herself. This pleased her because it meant she could have her favourite bench. There's one by a wall with bushes round it, and it means that you can sit there and see most of what's going on in the graveyard without necessarily being seen yourself. She sat down, she started to have her lunch, and then glancing up she noticed that in fact she wasn't alone. There was a man in the graveyard with her. Yeah. But the first thing she noticed about him was that he was wearing costume, clothes that would have been worn about 450 years ago in the time of Queen Elizabeth I. And it struck her immediately, perhaps there was some kind really of theatrical nice. event going on, or a film or a video, mm. something of that sort. She looked around for the other actors, camera, the crew, no sign of them anywhere, just this solitary gentleman walking around the graveyard. Now she said that although he had his back to her, uh, she could see that this man was an Elizabethan aristocrat. He had very expensive, well-made clothes. She also said that she had the impression that she, he was very sad. Mm -hmm. She said, although she couldn't see his face, it looked to her as though he had every broken heart in the world inside him. He was moving very slowly around the graveyard and appeared to be searching the ground at his feet as he went. He had his head bowed very low. She watched for some time and then as he disappeared behind the church, she turned her attention back to her food. But a few moments later, something made her look up. She wasn't sure what it was. It was a sensation, a feeling, an intuition. She didn't know what it was, but it made her look up. And when she did so, she could see that the man had now turned round and was walking directly towards her. She could see also that he wasn't, in fact, searching the ground with his head bowed very low. He had no head at all. <laughs> Said to be the ghost of the corpse of a man called Thomas Percy, the 7th Earl of Northumberland. Now he was considered, in the time that he lived, to be a traitor because he was a Roman Catholic, and he lived under the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, who was a Protestant. The punishment for traitors in those days was to be executed in public, to have your head removed, and then displayed on a wooden pole over one of the gates of the city. This happened to Thomas Percy, the 7th Earl of Northumberland. He was executed on the 22nd of August, 1572, and his head was piked over Micklegate Bar. But two years later, Catholic sympathisers removed his head and brought it away and buried it somewhere here in the churchyard of Holy Trinity Church. But nobody knows exactly where. But it is because the head was buried with a religious ceremony that the body, which wasn't, is now uneasy. Ah. The ghost of the body rises from the place where it was buried and comes here to search the graveyard, looking for the place where the head was buried. Now, people have often asked us if we know where that head was buried, and I must be honest and say, <laughs> I don't think there's anyone today who can tell you where they buried that head. But I've been in this graveyard on a large number of occasions, and I can tell you from experience that there is one place in this graveyard that is always as cold as the depths of winter. Where's one that? day... <laughs> Perhaps you'll have a chance to explore for yourself and find yourself in the middle of that cold spot. And it's possible that then you may be standing directly over the buried head of the 7th Earl of Northumberland. But you'll never know, will you? No. This is the churchyard at Long Compton. Upon the hill there, the roll right stones with an easy view of this church and churchyard. Late in 1879, James Haywood murdered an 80-year-old lady called Anne Tennant. 
he said she was a witch and that there were 16 other witches in this area that deserved the same fate. He was brought for trial at the Warwick Assizes and found to be insane. After the Black Mass in 1949, two furniture men delivering in this area were parked in a lay-by in the village. Suddenly, from nowhere, appeared a hideous old lady, at least 70 year old, with black, matted hair and a grey shawl. She walked across the road in front of them. They were so shocked that they stood and stared at her and then she disappeared. They wandered to the spot where they'd seen her and there was nothing there. They wonder if that could have been the witch or the ghost of Anne Tennant. And in 1979, a Mrs Downs of Long Compton wrote in a letter that many villagers here at Long Compton had seen the ghost of an old lady with matted hair and a shawl in the centre of the village. And they wonder if that is the ghost of Anne Tennant still haunting the village to this day. Here we are at Elverston Castle, one of the many, many stately homes still preserved in Derbyshire. Although this place goes back to the time of the Vikings, it was called Elvold's Tune. Someone called Elvold, a Viking, lived here many, many, many years ago. But now you can see the 1813 castle built on top of much earlier foundations. And if we go around the corner here, we can see the 16th century bit. Just look at the difference in the brickwork. This goes back to the 1600s and there's a ghost of a lady being seen inside this Elizabethan part of the castle. She's seen through this window here, wearing white, and she's been seen moving from side to side, backwards and forwards, as if she's sitting in a rocking chair. Many people have seen her from outside here and many of the staff that work in the castle have seen her on the inside. She's also been seen walking along this pathway which leads to the church and the churchyard. No one's quite sure whether she's actually a churchyard ghost or a castle ghost because she's been seen in both locations and of course passing between. But, uh, Let's go and have a look at the churchyard. These are the gates to the churchyard. This is the burial place of the Earls of Harrington. The first thing that greets us when we're here is this rather incredible gravestone. I'll read it to you. It's in memory of Stephen Alcock, who departed this life September the 18th, 1842. I once did stand as thou dost stand now, and viewed the dead as thou dost me. Ere long thou lie as low as I, and others stand and look on thee. Sobering thought. We're uh, now heading towards the, uh, the mausoleum, the crypt, where all the Earls of Harrington and the Duchesses of Harrington are also buried over here. But there's a very, very interesting grave on the other side of the graveyard. The yew hedge, of course, finishes here, but we're going out of the graveyard through this gap to visit someone else, not buried in the crypt with the other Harringtons. Rather overgrown area here, weeds, nettles, 
a large tree and a grave by it. And this is the grave of Kathleen Emily, widow of Dudley, Henry Eden, the ninth Earl of Harrington. Born 4th of November, 1862, died the 6th of August, 1949. She was the wife of the Earl of Harrington. Why is she buried outside the graveyard? And not only buried outside the graveyard, but her grave's the wrong way round. She's facing the wrong way. No one really knows why she's out here, unless there was a family rift, perhaps she divorced the Earl, we don't know. But there's a ghost in this graveyard of a lady, a white lady, that's been seen wandering around the graveyard. People have seen her at the dead of night, stopping and looking at different gravestones and shaking her head. Perhaps it's the ghost of Kathleen Emily that isn't resting because she's not buried in the graveyard or she's not with her husband just over the, the wall here where the mound is in the Harrington's family crypt. No one knows. And next to the grave of Kathleen Emily, we have the Happy Huntsman's Tree. The Earl of Harrington was a famous fox hunter and he was killed in a hunting accident in February 1917. And his hounds weren't brought out again for ages. But he left in his will a statement saying that on Boxing Day every year, his hounds should hunt. The hounds were let out of the stables here at Elverston but they couldn't get them to go anywhere. They were ran round and round in a circle around this area and gathered under this tree. And they couldn't get them to come away from this tree. And they say that the ghost of the Earl of Harrington haunts this area around the tree. But of course you must remember that this tree is in very close proximity to the mausoleum where the Earl's buried. Through this gate here, the mausoleum of all the Earls of Harrington. They're all buried in lead-lined coffins on shelves in full view through that large lead double door down those steps. How many folks have driven either north or south along the M1 and seen Bolsover Castle on one side and looked over up this hill and seen this gaunt decaying ruin on the top of the hill here and wondered what it was and who lived here. This is Sutton Scarsdale Hall, the home of the Leek family for many hundreds of years and a very, very haunted house indeed. Let's go in and have a look. And this is the interior or what's left of the interior of Sutton Scarsdale Hall. Many, many ghost stories to do with this place. Stories of dismembered arms floating, orange and white balls of light floating in the sky, smells of tobacco, footsteps, screams. But something actually happened to me when I came here a few years ago to do a Radio Derby broadcast. And we arrived with the radio car and parked just at the front here hoping to get a signal. There's a very large uh, mast just over the hill here, so there wouldn't have been any problem whatsoever in getting a signal. But just as we were going to go live, the signal disappeared. So very quickly we got the portable telephone out to try and um, do it over the telephone, but unfortunately the same thing applied. There was no signal from the telephone either. So we had to abandon it and go around the front building to see if we could do something from there. Everything was fine until we drove round there, put the mast up again, and exactly the same problem. We could not 
get a signal back to Derby from here under any circumstances, either telephone or radio. But as we drove down the drive, within 100 yards of this place, the portable phone went. And it was Radio Derby bringing us to see why they couldn't get through to them. There's absolutely no problems, but for some strange reason, no signals can be sent out from this place. And all the ghostly problems seem to emanate from the cellars of Sutton Scarsdale. This is the way down. It's locked. But we won't let that deter us, will we? <coughs> I'm not going alone. Here we are in the bowels, the depths of Sutton Scarsdale Hall. I haven't even got a torch with me. And I'm not going to go too far, because I don't know where these tunnels go to. And I don't want to disappear. But this is the problem place down here. This is where the smell of tobacco has been smelt by people from English Heritage that have been working on renovating the building. This is where they've heard the footsteps, down there in the inky blackness. And they believe that perhaps some awful deed was committed down here in the old cellars of the hall. These, in fact, look more like prison bars than cellarage doors, but uh, who knows what happened down here. But uh, I've stayed long enough. I'm, uh, I'm getting out of here. And we're in the graveyard at Sutton Scarsdale. This is one of the most atmospheric and some of the oldest gravestones that I've seen in any graveyard in Derbyshire. And there are a couple of legends to do with the church and the graveyard. One of Sir Francis Leake, a royalist, who was captured by Cromwell's soldiers and escaped to join the king. He was created First Lord Scarsdale. When the king was executed, Sir Francis had his own grave dug. And every Friday he dressed in sackcloth and laid in his open grave in commemoration of the king. Another legend to do with the Crusades and Sir Nicholas Leake. He, before leaving for the Crusades, took out his sword and split his wedding ring in half, giving half to his wife and keeping half. He was captured during the Crusades and spent many years in a dark, dank prison. One day dreaming of home, he was transported through the air and landed in the porch here at the church. He went to the doors of his house and demanded to be let in, but of course he was in such a bad state they didn't recognise him. He then remembered that he'd still got the split ring. He took it out of his pocket and told them to give it to his wife. She put the two pieces together and realised that her beloved was home. And every year Sir Nicholas had bread baked for the poor people of this parish distribute it to them with a large N for Sir Nicholas stamped on it. And the ghost of Sir Nicholas still haunts the porchway of this churchyard. <laughs>